Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar on safety and security. This 75 minutes webinar is aimed at learning how to use the journalist security assessment tool. Basically, this is a live uh, training session, which we are uh, calling webinar for our convenience. My name is Deepak Tiwari and I am GIJN's Hindi editor. My colleague Amal Ghani, GIJN Urdu editor, is also here to share with you the resources regarding safety and facilitate the question answer session at the end of the webinar. Security is essential for journalists and for investigative journalists in particular. Tackling the issue can be challenging due to its complexities. To make the process easier, GIJN has worked to develop the journalist security assessment tool, JSAT. JSAT, along with many other languages, is now available in Hindi and Urdu. The tool offers an online diagnosis of an organization's physical and digital security strength and resilience with recommendations on how to improve your security. It takes about an hour to complete. You will then receive recommendations which will help you prioritize the steps your organization needs to become more secure. In this GIJN webinar, we are pleased to have two senior international consultants who are experts on security issues and two senior journalists working in India and Pakistan. They will share their experiences from their region. Without further delay, let me introduce to our speakers today. Our first speaker is Matt Hansen. Matt Hansen is freelance writer and editor. His work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, The Week, Chicago Tribune, and the San Francisco Chronicle, and many other publications. Matt assists with digital and physical safety training for news and nonprofit nonprofit clients with GJS, a training provider for high risk environment. Runa, our second speaker is Runa Sandvik. She is a security researcher and trainer. She focuses on digital security for journalists and other at risk people. Her work builds upon her experiences working at the New York Times Freedom of the Press Foundation and the TOR project. Our third speaker is Poonam Agarwal. Poonam is an independent investigative journalist. She started her career as a television journalist and has worked for India's leading media channels like NDTV and Times Now. She has also worked for The Quint and BBC where her investigative stories were published. Her stories have been carried at various media platforms across the world. Our fourth an important speaker is Umar Chima. Umar is an investigative journalist in Pakistan. He is a leading journalist at Pakistani newspaper, The News, and is also co-founder of Fact Focus, an independent media organization focusing on investigating stories. In 2008, he won the Dan Pearl Journalism Fellowship, becoming the first Pearl Fellow to work at the New York Times. For some of you who are new to our webinars, the Global Journalism, Global Investigative Journalism Network, or GIJN, is the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations. We have 244 member organizations in 89 countries. However, we work with journalists everywhere in nonprofits, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. We have an extensive range of resources and tip sheets to help journalists worldwide, which you can check on our website, www.gijn.org. We also want to hear from you in the audience. So please uh, send your written uh, questions in the Q&A box. My colleague, Amil Ghani, will coordinate the question answer session in the end. We will try to accommodate as many as we can feel free to start asking questions from now. And also, I would like to remind you that during the webinar, we will be uh, circulating a feedback form in English, Hindi, and Urdu, whichever language uh, you are from. You please uh, fill that uh, feed feedback form so that uh, we get to know uh, about uh, this tool. 
So let's uh, start uh, without uh, making uh, any delay. So I would uh, request uh, Matt, that floor is yours. Thank you very much, Deepak. And thank you everyone for making time um, out of your, your evening schedule to join us. We appreciate it. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen here for a moment and we'll go ahead and, uh, and dive in. Please let me know if you have any trouble seeing the screen. Hopefully you can see the slides up here. Uh, and if you have any questions, as Deepak said, please do uh, put them in the chat or, or let us know. We're happy to take questions as we go, go through this presentation. You know, as, as Deepak said, um, Runa and I were lucky enough to be part of the team that developed the Journal of Security Assessment Tool or JSAT. So we're excited today to walk you through what the tool is, how it works, why you might want to use it for your organization or for yourself. And then Runa is also going to spend some time sharing her expertise uh, on how journalists can think about security and how security is unique for journalists in many ways uh, when we think about, about the landscape out there that we all face. So let's go ahead and start at the, at the very beginning here and just give everyone a grounding in what is JSAT, uh, how was it developed, and a little bit of background on, on the tool. So JSET was actually born originally from the Ford Foundation. Uh, the, if you may have heard that name, it's a pretty prominent, well-known philanthropic organization. It's one of the world's oldest and largest philanthropies, uh, and it funds projects and programs around the world that combat inequality. That's its goal. And that can take a lot of different forms, uh, everything from funding organizations like GIJN and supporting other types of causes uh, worldwide. Uh, so really a great organization, and Runa and I were lucky enough to collaborate with Ford uh, on this project. We were part of a team known as the CAT team, which is the cybersecurity advisory team uh, within, within Ford. Uh, you can see this is the team here. Uh, we were led by a, um, a really well-known, well-respected uh, individual in cybersecurity, Matt Mitchell, who was at that time a Ford uh, Foundation Technology Fellow, has now moved on to a new role within Ford. Uh, but as you can see here, we have a, a really unique and, and interesting multidisciplinary team of cybersecurity experts. I was the project manager of, of the, the program, but really the, the true stars of the program here are, are to my right on the slide here. Uh, Runa Sandvik, as, as Deepak said, probably uh, the world's leading expert on journalist security, cybersecurity in particular, uh, and, and really an incredible resource to have on our team with a background working with journalists at the New York Times and other organizations. Martin Routen, an expert in malware and antivirus uh, solutions. Trin Nguyen specializes in community building around cybersecurity. And Laura Teach specializing in uh, the unique risks facing individuals and organizations in the global south. So just a great team to work with uh, on, this, on this project. Uh, we started off by building something called CAT, or the CAT tool, Cybersecurity Assessment Tool. And you can see that that version of that actually lives today on the Ford Foundation website. This was really intended to be a tool that allowed organizations to take a snapshot of where they were currently uh, in their cybersecurity journey. As we all know, as you work for newsrooms, um, you work potentially as independent journalists, cybersecurity, incredibly important, but often something that falls by the wayside as we focus on our work. So the cybersecurity assessment tool was really intended to put cybersecurity front and center for organizations and make it easier for them to understand and make it easier for them to uh, take, take measures to, uh, to keep their, themselves and their, their data and their information and their people safe. Once CAT had been launched, uh, we actually partnered with GIJN uh, to help build a version of the CAT tool that was specifically for journalists. This is JSAT, which is what we're talking about today. So a lot of the framework, uh, the foundation of JSAT really comes from the CAT tool, but JSAT truly is a unique creation uh, that Runa and I were really proud to work on together along with the experts at GIJN to create something that was sort of narrowly focused on the needs of journalism organizations. So the tool is really designed to speak the language of journalists, to address their common security concerns, uh, and to help empower you all, hopefully, uh, to prioritize security. So that's a little bit of background. I, I'm gonna let Runa have the floor here, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how to actually use JSAT. But Runa, would you mind walking us through 
uh, from your perspective, some of the key security challenges that are facing journalists and just let me know when you need me to change slides. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for the introduction and, and all the kind words. Okay, just jump to the next slide. So in, in thinking about the many different types of, of threats facing reporters, um, specifically focusing on uh, the sort of digital risks and and threats. There's been a lot, um, a lot that has been written about mobile spyware, in particular NSO's uh, Pegasus over the years. Um, you may remember the Pegasus project in, I think, the summer of 2021, if I remember correctly, um, just illustrating just how many people had potentially been targeted with uh, spyware by governments around the world. So that's certainly one risk and one sort of potential threat affecting a lot of reporters, but um, it's not necessarily super, super common. Uh, during uh, the pandemic, or I should say perhaps at the start of the pandemic with, with the lockdowns, there was a lot of, um, I think a lot of us just had to like suddenly figure out how do we do what we do, but now at home, alone, in front of our computers, with our phones, our laptops, all of our online accounts. How do we continue to then communicate with our editors, with our colleagues, with friends, with potential sources? And how do we then also keep all of that information safe? And I don't think that we're going to um, rely on technology any less moving forward. So it's, again, it's, it's, it's then just a question of how do we do what we do? online with all of this technology, but then also in a safe way. Um, another is sort of if you followed any sort of cybersecurity news over the past few years, there's definitely been um, an increase in ransomware, especially I think in uh, both in the US and in Europe, where companies have for whatever reason, right, not fully updated their systems, they get some virus on some computer somewhere within the company that then uh, takes over and encrypts all the files on on that computer and potentially also on other computers and then demands uh, money from from the company. So there's been like an increase in that over the years, which I think is important for um, organizations to consider, whether media or um, in another type of uh, industry. And this, I think the two um, items at the bottom of this slide, I think are the ones that um, are most important for reporters to consider that when, when looking at the ways in which that reporters um, and media organizations are are, are hacked to use that phrase. What I see most often is that there is a risk to someone's online account, like their email account or their social media account, either because they have reused passwords. So the password is the same across all of the accounts or it's the same password for Twitter that um, someone used 10 years ago on some other type of websites. There's a lack of two-factor authentication, which means that if someone does um, learn your password, they can just access that online account, um, lack of sort of software updates, um, and then also the unfortunate, I guess, rise of online threats and harassment, bullying on social media, um, doxing, which is the sort of practice of, of someone spending spending a good amount of time trying to figure out just everything about you your personal life all of your online accounts photos you may have posted in the past your friends your family and then just share that online for for everyone to see and i think it's like those two that um the bottom two on the slide here that that i've seen the most of um in the last few years that um, both individual reporters and then also media workers have to um, tackle. Matt, do you want to add anything on this slide? Uh, 
Okay. So what does security look like in newsrooms? Let's just jump ahead. So uh, when I think of security for a journalist, I think about um, what it will take to secure you as an individual with everything you do from the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed. So whether you're traveling, whether you're uh, meeting a, a source for coffee, whether you're doing research on the internet, you're trying to make phone calls, you receive some information. Um, and I think that that in many cases means that you use both your corporate laptop and your corporate email and whatever sort of corporate pub publishing system you have, but probably also your personal phone, your personal social media accounts. Um, there's a good mix of both corporate and personal technology in the mix. I think that being a journalist is far more than, than just nine to five. So I can't just focus on securing your corporate email account and say that, great, that's done. You are now secure as a journalist. I have done my job. I think that um, we really do have to view it as securing an identity. I think being a journalist is just, that's who you are. That is what you're up to. That's that's what you do. And so we have to really take that into account when then thinking about what's it going to take to then enable you to do your work safely. Um, I think that it is in some cases inherently risky work both online and offline. I think there's a lot that's been written uh, over the years about security risks to both um, a journalist's sort of physical safety and also their online safety. And, and again, since we're securing an identity, we really do need to account for security in all of those different buckets, not just in one particular sort of corner. Um, different people have different concerns and needs and threats. I think one thing that was very, very clear to me when I worked at the New York Times is um, that the types of questions that investigative reporters will ask may be very different than the questions um, from the journalists writing obituaries. That's not to say that one cares about security any, any less, it's just there will be some people that will be more familiar with the potential risks and threats with the work that they're doing. And there will be some that um, maybe are very, very comfortable with technology and maybe they even write some code themselves and they're like very um, aware of the, the types of, of challenges that exist within cybersecurity and, and some will not. And I think as an educator and then also as um, I think someone supporting the work that the reporters are doing, you do really need to be aware that um, you can't really start out everyone like on the same level. I think some people will just need a bit of a different context um, for whatever it is that you're trying to help them with. And I think that there is a there is a need for like trust and usable solutions. I have seen over the years that if you as an IT person at a media organization try to tell um, a group of people that they have to do something a certain way or they have to use that corporate email account or they have to use that corporate laptop. I think at some point that's just going to like fall through the cracks. I think that if you don't create solutions that actually work for the people that you're supporting, at some point, they're either not going to use it, like they're going to travel with their personal laptop because it's nicer or it's lighter or um, it, it has all the tools that they need. And they're not necessarily going to come to you for guidance and for support because you haven't demonstrated that you actually get the type of work that they're doing. So I think that when it comes to supporting reporters, um, especially as sort of the any any team on like the business side of of a media org i think it's just really really important to really demonstrate that you get the work that is taking place and you get the exactly what it what it takes for people to do it matt anything you want to add no i think that was a great a great summary i'm, I'm really glad you highlighted one one thing that i think we're seeing increasingly which is that relationship between 
digital and physical risk. Um, more and more, there's a connection there, and those two worlds really are are in sync. So that was a great point. I think too, and to add to that, and, and maybe that's something that we can come back to during the Q and A as as well is that like when I when I think about um, security for a journalist, I think about security for a person, which means physical, digital legal in the context of the work that reporters are doing especially and also emotional i think doing this type of work day in and day out in in some um often sort of risky not necessarily very safe environments i think can be very very stressful and so i think like all of that will then impact what you're able to take in in terms of new knowledge or learning new tools or uh, doing something in a different way so just gonna park that there and maybe we can get back to some of that later on. Um, security for journalists is different. I think when, when I talk to security teams at media orgs, and I think this has sort of shifted a bit now from five years ago, but it used to be um, very much the case that security teams at media organizations would consider their remit to be just the corporate devices, the corporate laptops, the corporate computers, the corporate email accounts, the publishing platform. And anything beyond that, for example, our reporter's Twitter account would be considered their personal account. It wouldn't necessarily be the responsibility of the security team at the media org. To help with. Um, and I think that is sort of where we start running into this challenge of like, there is then a limit in how much the security team can do to su fully support the journalists. And you sort of run into this combination of like, well, what is corporate? What is personal? What can we actually do within this, this space to, to help people work safely? I think it's also just worth noting that security teams, I think, at any organization in any space is often overwhelmed and under resourced. There's a lot of different things to take into account, to focus on, to secure, to um, get budget for. And so it makes sense then that that also supporting individual reporters in a big newsroom does become a challenge, especially when uh, reporters will often have very context specific questions that need support. You can't necessarily provide um, the type of guidance that will fit every single reporter in your newsroom. I think it's also um, important to be as a security person for uh, a media work to be proactive instead of reactive, because I think that if I am to be reactive, that means that it's first up to you to come and tell me what you need and what your question is and um, what you're running into. And I think that puts the sort of onus on you to then first become more aware of cybersecurity and risks and threats. And I can do a lot to help educate you on those topics and sort of make sure that that you are doing your work in the safest way possible if I am proactive with that um, as opposed to reactive. But that again, that sort of changes the model of it for how um, security teams at, at media orgs typically work. Um, and then the same goes for corporate versus personal. I think, you know, if a, a reporter, like let's say that you have a um, a journalist on Twitter with a lot of followers, they tweet daily, they have a good sort of community built up around that account, and they have a lot of engagement, and they do very much use it for, for work. Um, technically, like, that Twitter account is a personal account, but if that Twitter account is hacked, that's going to impact not just the journalist and the um, relationship that they have with the community that they've built up with all other followers with any potential sources but it is also going to impact the reputation of the organization that the journalist works for um, and again that just sort of becomes a bit of a fascinating sort of challenge and 
where do you draw the line as a security team at a media organization? Uh, uh, Runa, can I uh, interrupt you uh, a little bit? Yes, go for uh, it. In, in this part of the world where uh, most of our audience is from, legal questions, legal security uh, is a major area of concern. I mean, now journalists, they are being, uh, you know, coerced through legal uh, actions. There will be slap suits and so many things. So, I mean, of course, one as a journalist, one always uh, take care that he doesn't uh, write anything which is uh, not in that purview. I mean, uh, what do you have to say on this? I mean, uh, Yeah, I think it's a it's a really, really important question. Um, I think that sort of the two things that that come to mind right away would be one, it, it just very much highlights the the importance of um, whenever possible consulting with a legal team in in the course of your work and, and to at least be be aware of the potential legal challenges of the work that you're doing and also the rights that you have and then i think from there um from a digital security point of view i think that if i um let's say that i have my laptop and i have all of my research and my drafts and my notes on that laptop if i have a uh, either no password or a very, very simple password on that laptop and that laptop is taken away from me by law enforcement, they could just potentially access that laptop without my actually giving them the password, giving them access to everything that is there. If I have a very, very strong password and I know that I do have the right legally to deny them that search and deny them that knowledge, at least then I have a choice of whether or not I give them the password and give them access to that content. And so I think that there's this combination of being aware of your rights and having legal support, but then also knowing then how to secure the information digitally so that you do have a bit more of a choice if and when someone does come and uh, try to access that information. Um, I think I'll pass it on to Matt Hansen because I think he's got a couple of thoughts on the topic as well. Yeah, thanks, Runa. It is something that we we thought about when we put together the, the JSAT tool. I know Runa and I had some conversations about it, and the rest of the team also spoke about this as well. Obviously, we are not lawyers, but we do have some insight into sort of the, the digital security side of it. I think one other aspect that I would I would uh, mention, just as, as, it's, as it's important, as Runa said, to secure your data on your device, it's also important to think about where your data is stored off your device as well, um, how accessible that is, how secure that is. Um, thinking about things like encrypted cloud storage and things like that, without going too far down a technical rabbit hole here, I think those are good questions to think about, particularly if you know you're working on a very sensitive story that may have some legal ramifications thinking about where that, that information is stored, where are you storing your interview records, your transcripts, your recordings, things like that um, can really be important. If you were, for example, subpoenaed, you know, making sure that data is stored somewhere securely where you know where it is, where you know how to access it, where you know how to protect it, I think are all, are all good steps to take uh, as you do this work. But just to echo what Runa said, absolutely, it's something we encourage as you take the tool. We have a legal section that asks you a couple questions. And one of our big recommendations uh, is always, you know, consult with a legal team and understand the relevant, you know, law that governs media uh, in your region. All right, Runa, is there anything else you want to add before I uh, move into the how to use the tool? Um... I think so. I think that I think the conversation that, that we were just having about legal challenges is really important. And so maybe we can revisit that um, when we're done with the slides. I just want to make sure that we can also get some input from Deepak and uh, Amal and the rest of the team. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. We we are uh, we want to defer to the subject matter experts here um, for for you know regional risks. And so absolutely, that's a crucial conversation to have. Um, I also saw a Q&A question come in. It's a great question around security for freelancers. And we're gonna to touch on that here in just a minute. 
All right, so I just want to spend just a couple minutes talking a little bit more about JSAT. If you've had the opportunity to use the tool, fantastic. If you haven't used it yet, uh, you know we encourage you to. It's free, it's accessible on the GIJN site uh, in multiple languages, as the team noted. So the, the tool really focuses on five key areas that we think are, are critical for newsrooms to address. We're starting at the high level with what we call operational security. Then we get more specific, more granular. We talk about securing your devices. We talk about securing your digital accounts. We talk about your physical security and that relationship, again, between physical and digital safety. And then we talk about what we call associated risks. And I'll break those down a little further. Those are things that, that Runa mentioned, things like cyberbullying, doxing, risks that you know, may not directly affect uh, your accounts or your devices, but they are, you know, they are risks that we wanna take seriously. So just a quick kind of overview of what we mean when we talk about operational security. And again, I just want to emphasize that we designed JSAT to really work on an organizational level as opposed to an individual level. That doesn't mean if you're a freelancer that you can't use it, or if you're an individual journalist that you can't use it. We encourage you to, and I think you'll find it useful. But we've really designed it for newsrooms to be able to, and other journalism organizations, to be able to take a big picture view of their security and come up with recommendations on, on how to stay safe. Um, and the reason that we want to start at that organizational level as opposed to the individual level is that we can start to have a bigger impact if we look at the, the sum of the organization, the total totality of the organization as opposed to individuals, right? Uh, and operational security is, is really the highest level. It's, it's, if you think about it, uh, it's almost like the 30,000 foot view. It's, it's high up, it's overlooking, you know, all the security related decisions that your organization makes. It's essentially how your newsroom operates. So it's things, it'll ask you questions about things like, how do you think about risk? How do you determine when a story is too risky to cover? How do you determine which stories are appropriate to cover? Uh, do you have security policies? For example, do you have anything written down, any documentation that your staff needs to follow to stay safe? Do you train your staff to think about security? Do they understand uh, their, their cybersecurity risk? Do they understand their physical security risk? Do they know what to do if they're covering an event that turns violent, for example? So those are questions that we want to ask about. And then we want to ask about things more internal, things like what do you do when your folks travel? Right? If you have reporters who go into the field or who leave the country to travel, do you, have you thought about how to keep them safe? Do you work in a physical office? I know many of us still work remotely, but for those of you who still have that physical newsroom, how do you think about security for a physical building as well? Uh, and how do you protect your, your data, both on the premises and off the premises? So these are all the kind of operational questions that we really want to dive in and get that big picture view uh, before we get more specific. So that's really where the tool starts off. Then we want to talk about devices. Almost all of us uh, have at least one digital device that we probably use every day. It might be a laptop, it might be a phone, it might be a combination of those things. But uh, of course, you know, so much of journalism re relies on our devices. Um, whether we're working in the field or we're working at home or working in the office, you know, these are really the lifeblood of what we do. So we want to think about, again, how does your newsroom handle these devices? What types of devices do people use? Do you have a policy that governs the way people can use their devices? For example, uh, if you, can you use your own device for work, or do you have to use a dedicated work device? Those kind of questions. Software security, another big one. We all know how costly and, and frustrating it can be sometimes to, to find the right software for the job. Um, are you using licensed software? Are you using unlicensed software? How up to date is your software? All these questions that we want to better understand and, and get a better picture of, of your device security. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, how do you store your data and where do you store your data uh, is really going to be critical as well. So these are all questions that we're going to ask in this section. We're then going to think about account security. I'm sure all of us have multiple online accounts that we use every day. That can be an email, that can be an online banking account, that can be a tool that we use for work. You know, so many of us who live our lives uh, online, you know, have hundreds of these accounts, right? 
Uh, from a newsroom perspective, how do you manage those accounts? How do you ensure that your reporters are managing their passwords appropriately, for example? So as Runa said, that they're not reusing uh, the same password across multiple accounts. Um, what are some tools they can use to stay safer when doing that? Do they use particular online services? Do they use social networking platforms like Twitter? What's, you know, how do you think about securing those accounts as well? Continuity is another question that often comes up in the tool, which is what happens if a staff member leaves the organization and they have access to a certain account, who takes over that account? Or if you have a staff member, of course, you know, we hope this would never happen, but a staff member who is detained or imprisoned uh, and you can't reach them, how do you access their accounts? So all these questions around, uh, around digital accounts, I think are, are really critical to address. And I see a question here uh, around uh, journalists who are arrested, in some cases tortured, to access data on their devices, and particularly to access that password. Um, and, and of course, that is, a, that is an unfortunate risk that we see all over the world. And I think that using something like JSAT can really help. Um, we, can, we can talk more about securing passwords in the, in the question and answer session, but I think that you know, taking, using this tool can help guide you on some, some relatively you know, simple steps that you can take to help safeguard some of that information. Sometimes in some cases, you know, the best password is a password that's inside your password manager that you don't even know. Um, so we can, we can talk more about that. Physical security, another topic that we think of course is critical. How do you keep your staff safe, but also how do you keep your sources safe, right? Because people take risks to talk to journalists and we wanna ensure that we're not putting them at risk either. So thinking about, uh, are your, in, your reporters being surveilled? Do you know if there's surveillance occurring? Are they being arrested or detained? Uh, are they being intimidated, physically intimidated on the street as they do their work? So all these things kind of fall under this, under this umbrella. We talked a little bit about legal risks, um, protecting your office, training, all these, these fall under this category. And this part of the tool will really address your physical security risk. And then lastly, we, we want to think about associated risks. And again, these are the risks that may not feel like they are as big or as important as the others, but are, are really oftentimes warning signs that things are going wrong, right? And so doxing is a great example, as Runa said. This is when someone has done research on you as an individual, and then they release private information about you publicly, your address, phone number, relatives information, things like that. That happens frequently to journalists all over the world. Uh, and it's a, oftentimes it's a sign that you know, the risk level has increased and that's a warning sign to take, uh, to take you know, more, more strict action around your security. But there are other risks as well, things like identity theft, harassment, again, both cyberbullying uh, as well as in-person harassment, and then of course hacking as well if you have an account hacked or taken over. So the tool is really designed to walk you through all these different categories. And I just wanted to give you a sense for some of the, the security challenges that we address. Does anyone have any questions on that? Um, otherwise we can keep, keep moving on, on how to use the tool. Yeah, I, I think uh, we can uh, move on this. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Absolutely. All right, so for those of you who haven't used JSAT yet, I just wanna give you a quick overview of how it works. Uh, the best way to learn how to use it, of course, is to just go to the site, uh, test it out. Uh, it should take about 30 minutes to an hour. In some cases, if you have a large organization with a lot of stakeholders, it might take closer to two hours to do, uh, but we, we, you know, we do think we, we tried to design it so that you can move through it relatively quickly. We know that there is a lot of information that you might not have when you sit down to take JSAT. If you're a reporter you know, within a newsroom, you may not know all the answers to some of the questions around your systems and things like that. So you might need to enlist the help of other members of your team. You might need, for example, to talk to your IT department or talk to your managing editor or talk to you know, other, other folks on, within the newsroom who can help you to answer some of these questions. You might also even need to get answers from third parties as well. Maybe you have a company that helps run your email system or a company that uh, takes care of you know, your website. These would be organizations you would wanna reach out to and get information from them in order to get the most accurate answers from the JSAT tool. 
Once you've gone through the questions, you'll get a rating for each category that I just talked about. So each of those, those individual risks will be addressed. You'll get a um, really a rating out of three and three possible categories. You'll either be a little bit below the recommendation, you'll be at the recommended level, or you'll exceed the recommended level. And with each level, you'll also get recommendations on how to improve your security. So if you're a little bit below where we'd like you to be, we'll offer you some recommendations on how to get to improve. If you're at the level that we think you, uh, you should be, we'll give you recommendations on how to exceed that. And if you're doing an excellent job in that category, we'll offer you some recommendations on how to go even beyond that. So we really tried to design this so that wherever, whatever level you're at, you'll get some sort of personalized recommendations back. I should say also that this is the version one of JSET. We actually have some plans to redesign the tool, to continue to push forward and make it even more useful. We would love your feedback so that we can continue that process, uh, but we definitely encourage you to try this out. Real quickly, this is what the tool looks like right now. You can see it's very simple, it's very basic. We've designed it to work uh, on most platforms, including your smartphone. So you can take it wherever you are, you can take it with low bandwidth, um, with an unstable internet connection, it should work on, uh, you know, on most of these platforms uh, and essentially walks you through a series of questions. So here is an example from the operational security section. It'll ask you some, some basic questions. You check the boxes, you go to the next question, and you do that until you've reached uh, the conclusion. Again, here's another example. And you can see that these are you know, relatively simple questions. You just choose you know, which bubble, which answer applies most to you. Um, if you don't know, there's an option for that. That's fine. If that doesn't apply to you, there's an option for that as well. And then all of these questions behind the scenes will help you will help generate a score for your organization. So you'll come back with a snapshot of where you are currently. You'll see that as you proceed, there's these uh, little progress markers that show you where you are in the tool. So for example, once you complete one section, there'll be a little introduction to the next section and you go through each one until you've finished. If, you're, if you need to gather more information, you need a break, uh, you know, you've got a breaking news story, you have to run and you can't finish the tool, you can always click save and resume later. That will send you a link and you can click that link uh, within 48 hours and you can finish filling out the tool. Once you've gotten to the recommendations uh, portion, you'll see that there's, again, a, a rough um, level that you meet. So for example, here, your organization has room for improvement, but don't worry, here are some recommendations. And then here's your recommendation list that you can use to, to implement. Some of these recommendations uh, you yourself can do without much technical background. Other recommendations, we encourage you to find a third-party security provider to help you, uh, to help you handle those. And then lastly, each recommendation all, all also comes with an example. This is a fictional example, but it's based on a real world events. So it's an example of how a sample nonprofit handled this risk, uh, took some steps and, and improved their security. So what happens um, once you've taken JSAT? If you work in IT or security for a news organization, we would suggest that you use JSET to help you find some gaps and, and update those gaps. And we would recommend using the tool about once a year. If you're a reporter, again, more than welcome to take the tool. I think it's useful for anyone, but share your findings, share the tool with other reporters, colleagues in your organization, say, hey, these were my results, what were your results? And then share results with your IT department because ultimately they are going to be best equipped to help you uh, take care of some of these concerns. And if you're an editor using the tool, we would suggest presenting the findings to newsroom leadership. Uh, try to implement the changes that you can implement. Find a security provider to help you implement changes that might be too uh, technical. And make sure, again, that you inform IT of what you find. All right. So I think I just want to touch briefly on uh, a couple things here. And Runa, please jump in if there's anything I'm missing. Um, yep. 
if you are a reporter and you're talking about security to your editors, which oftentimes happen, right? Um, let's say you've taken the JSAT, you're empowered to have this conversation, but you're not sure how your editors are going to react. Uh, I think the first thing is to make sure that you're in a situation where both parties are willing to listen, right? You have to make sure that as a reporter, you feel empowered to have the conversation, but you also want to make sure that your editor is receptive as well, right? So find a time when both parties are willing to sit down and have a you know, respectful conversation about what you both need. I think it's important not to make any assumptions, right? Uh, reporters sometimes assume that editors don't care about security. Editors assume that reporters might be complaining too much. You know, all these, we, we know how these sides go within newsrooms. So try and have a level playing field. Try to have respect on both sides when you have this conversation. Um, and of course, make sure that security is part of the conversation. Rune, is there anything you'd want to add here? Yes, I I had a thought and then it slipped. Um, ah, I was going to say that I think that this is a, it's also an opportunity for um, you as a reporter to help educate your, your editor on, on just what the current risks and, and threats are related to your work. I think that is always going to be like a bit of a shifting and evolving landscape. And, and so I think that it's an opportunity just for, for both sides to um, to listen and to learn and to, um, I think, all be on the same page about exactly what it's going to take for, for you to do your work safely. Thank you. And then, of course, the conversation can go the other way as well, right? Uh, if you're an editor and you're encouraging your reporters to become more security minded, perhaps potentially you've taken the JSAT tool, you feel empowered to have the conversation. I think understand that security may not be something that everyone prioritizes in their work. As Runa said earlier, uh, you know, some reporters may take security more seriously than others based on what they're covering. So come into it with the assumption that security may be new. Um, Explain what you're trying to do, right? Make sure you articulate the goals of, of the, the program that you're, that you're working on. Understand that some people might be resistant to change. We've done things a certain way. We've always done it this way. Why do we have to change things now? So being able to explain that, that really you are, you are pushing for positive change to make things better. Rune, anything you want to add here? I think as, as with most things, like there's no, there's no, done for security work and there's no uh there's really no good way for you to go from like zero to 100 either so i think recognizing that it's sort of a continuing process you can like take some small steps today you can take some small steps next month you can plan for how you're going to improve security for your team or your organization over the next year but as we just mentioned about the sort of shifting and evolving landscape, I think this is a conversation to just continue having and just sort of make that a new normal. Well said, absolutely. So. Go on, uh, get back. Yeah, the, the, I mean, uh, we have two more speakers, uh, Runa. So uh, how much more time uh, are we going to take in this? Good That's morning. fine. I think we can yeah. we can skip we the slide. Yep. Um, and yep. Matt, is there anything left in the deck that, that you really want to touch on? If not, I think it's fine to just. Yeah, I think the only thing I just want to touch on briefly, just because it was a question that came up, was just how to use JSET as a freelancer. So I'll go through this super quickly. Um, you know, many security fixes don't have to be expensive, right? You can take you can take some basic measures to improve your security without having to uh, to spend a lot of money, and JSET will give you some guidance on that. If you're working with a larger organization, a larger newsroom, for example, uh, potentially you can you can ask them for support also. And we also, of course, encourage you to, to network with groups uh, that international groups that provide access and resources to freelancers. And there are a couple listed here, uh, including GIJN, uh, which can help provide you with resources. So just wanted to put that out there that if you are a freelancer, this tool also works for you as well. And uh, we can make this deck available afterwards, which has some links in it. But I think this is a good place to stop and definitely want to cede the floor to our uh, to our, our two experts who can speak more to the to the local risks here. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you, Runa. Uh, this was really, really uh, wonderful and very helpful for uh, uh, our people who have uh, 
who want to take this uh, test or who want uh, who had already taken this test. So now uh, may I invite uh, Poonam to uh, please speak, Poonam, and then we'll uh, listen to Omar. Um, to begin with, Deepak, uh, first of all, how much time do I have? Um, uh, uh, we have around 20, 22 minutes left in all. So okay. all answer session, so it has to Ten be minutes. divided between you and Umar, yeah. Okay, so uh, see, I want to, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Matt and Runa, for this beautiful presentation. It was really good to know what all help we can get through uh, JSAT. So I would talk about the practical experience that I've faced in the past 18, 19 years of my investigative journalism and few things which I have learned in the process. Since I, I am based out of Delhi and as rightly pointed out by Deepak that these days, especially in the past few years in India, what we are facing is the legal case. Journalists are facing a lot of criminal cases against them for articles which are not even that controversial, but but unfortunately, we have been going through a lot uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, some of the reports which did not go down well with the current government. So I would only suggest few things to the journalists who are actually dealing with sensitive, I would say not even sensitive, but stories which directly are on the establishment against the government, especially those who are on the, in the higher ups. So if we are dealing with such stories which actually question the policies of the government or questions the current government uh, functioning, or is it if it is re related to something like uh, uh, recently we have seen so many, uh, you know, uh, policies like electoral bonds, EVMs, all those controversies, then when we are reporting such stories, we should ensure that the documents, the interviews, everything are in recorded or in material form or paper form, because these evidence are the only thing which are going to save you later after the story is published, because we get to know the repercussion of the stories only after it is aired or published. Sometimes while writing the story, we feel that it's just, you know, it is a good story investigative piece, but might not have those kind of repercussion. And we actually lag there and we do not keep our uh, staff, our evidence intact. And I've, I have um, met few journalists who have, you know, done simple interviews, but those interviews were, you know, again, questioning the government functioning or the policies and later on, when the stories were uh, published, you know, the person who were interviewed, they, they stepped back, no, we never said that. And then, you know, if that reporter faces any problem, legal case, then he or she doesn't have any legal evidence. The first thing that we should ensure that the interview, if we are interviewing, uh, doing an interview with any person, and um, if it is for the print, then just keep an audio recording of that interview for your own safety. Because we never know when we might need it. And when we do such interviews, we can obviously ask the person that I'm doing this interview, I'm recording it for my safety. I'll not publish it anywhere, but I'll just write it down. Secondly, data storage, which was also taken up by in the JSAT. Data storage is the most important, most important thing, but I will just like to add here that what happens sometimes when we record it on a card or on a chip or on our mobile phone what we do is that we record we transfer the footage or the recording from our gadget to the laptop and then delete it from the main source do not ever do that in in our case in, in india i'm talking about india and the legal system the original card or the chip is the most important evidence. If you transfer the footage from the original gadget to the laptop, it will not be considered as original footage. So the card or the or the dictaphone or the mobile phone, anything that you use, always keep the original recording intact. If possible, take the card out, do not re uh, reuse it at all. Keep it aside till the time you feel that the story is out and you're not going to face any criminal case in that matter. Because if you are 
ever pulled up by the you know uh, courts or the police or anything happens then you will be asked to provide the original chip otherwise your footage which is present on the laptop will become questionable and it can be considered as tampered evidence also so the original card has its own value all these keep that safe now the the question is also being raised about like the recording how is it in not in all cases it's possible to do video recording documentations even the whatsapp messages that we exchange always preserve them always preserve them in some form the original exchange the whatsapp exchange the, and, and uh, again in my case it happened that i asked the government about uh, you know, a few questions which were asked over the WhatsApp, the spokesperson told me to send it on the WhatsApp and the exchange happened. Then later on, that person just refused that, no, you never sent anything. Then I, then I just sent him the screenshot. No, I asked you. Then he took a step back because sometimes they do not understand the value of what we are asking over the WhatsApp has, is also there. They will always consider email. So these are the safeguards which we always we should keep in mind that any sort of uh, exchange or any sort of message, it should be kept till the time you feel the story is out and safe. Now, recently in India, many journalists were raided. Many, many people, uh, many officers were raided. All of us are aware of it. Editors were being called for some reason by the enforcement directorate or CBI. Now, what happens when any organization is raided the first thing that these um in a, like uh, investigating agencies they do they try to get hold of your gadgets and for all of us our gadgets is the most important thing because it not only contains sensitive documents but also the uh, numbers of our sources apart from our personal things we should try to use you know keep our official gadget and personal gadget separate but honestly, it doesn't really work all the time. I have two phones, but it just, you know, we end up, you know, using both of them together. Sometimes, you know, uh, it happens. So, yes, we should try to keep them separate as much possible. But if you have to use your personal phone. So in scenario like this, if at all the, there is a raid or you've been raided by the cops and you are being asked to give your gadgets please use your journalistic power here. I'm talking about my case. In my case itself, uh, the raid did not happen, but I was asked by the cops to surrender my laptop, my personal laptop, my personal phones, my office phone, as well as office laptop. In this case, uh, of course, uh, I used my office laptop, but my personal phone was also used for, for some of the work. Uh, but the... But here, when the entire thing was happening, uh, my lawyer clearly told me not to surrender them. Now, what will happen? Since the gadgets were with me, of course, the cops went to the court and they said that they fear that I'll tamper with the evidence. Now, in this case, I'm talking about the Bombay High Court. The court said that, what is the option? I was ready to give the give my gadgets, but not to the cops, because I knew that if at all it goes to the cops, it can be misused as in they can plant evidence in that. And we have seen in some cases, Bhima Koregao case, it's a popular case in India. Some of us are aware how the evidence were planted in the gadgets remotely. So in this case, what happened, uh, the court decided that they will, keep the gadget with the registrar. The registrar of the court was asked to keep the gadget till the case is concluded. In that way, even I was safe because it was not with me, nor did it go to the cops. So here I used my journalistic power. I pleaded the court before the judge that this gadget, the laptop, the official laptop, my official phone, they have so documents and uh, you know the sensitive documents pertaining to other cases and also some of my sources will be revealed through it and those cases in some cases if at all it goes to the cops they might misuse it for the investigation and the investigation may get hampered this was the plea which was placed before the court 
And on the basis of that, the court eventually decided that it should not go to the corpse. Rather, it should be with the uh, registrar. And till then, till the time investigation or the in, uh, investigators, they come up with some concrete you know, evidence to prove that my phones have some documents which they need to take it out. So this is how I managed to safeguard my gadget. And trust me, it is very difficult. I, it's not that, it's not a cakewalk. It doesn't work all the time, but in my case, it did work. And my uh, FIR was eventually quashed by the court, Bombay High Court, and I got my gadgets back from the registrar, which was a big thing for me because it doesn't really work all the time. So, but again, I managed to do all of these and safeguard my equipment, my gadgets from, from going into the hands of the cops for a simple reason that I used my journalistic power. Yeah. And that is the thing which most of us forget when we face the, these problems. We have to tell the police, the court, everyone that our phones are having certain sensitive things and documents, which if, if it all goes in public domain or it goes in someone else's hand who can probably misuse it, then it might hamper the investigation or the case or anything. So this is one thing I would request all of you to keep in mind if it all, God, for, God forbid, any of you face any criminal charge, but if at all you face anything, then keep the, these things in mind that the storage of your get, of your documents, of your audio clips, original card should be kept with you. Do not keep, you know, just transfer and discard them. Always keep them intact. And when you are being asked to give your gadgets, you can say no, because you have every right to say no, as it does compromise your sources as well. Great, great. Thank you, Poonam, so much. Thank you so much, Poonam. Uh, and you are really fortunate to uh, get your FIR quashed because this is this is something, a very difficult thing in our legal system, we all know. Yes. And uh, your point is well taken that uh, keep your uh, original uh, gadget safe. So uh, now moving on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Umar uh, Chima, who works with OCCRP, which I didn't uh, mention in the beginning. So Umar, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, please unmute uh, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a quite uh, interesting discussion and very useful. And um, uh, especially what Poonam said, uh, it is something regional. Um, we live in two different countries, but uh, almost facing uh, similar challenges. Uh, at points, uh, I strongly uh, agree with her and uh, rather want to add further into it. Um, uh, as for the gadgets it's concerned, uh, recently uh, uh, a journalist was picked up in Pakistan. His name, uh, his name is Shahid Islam. And uh, uh, as a backgrounder, uh, uh, which uh, organization website you mentioned me uh, as a co-founder, which I'm not, uh, Fact Focus, uh, it is run by our uh, former colleague and they did a story about uh, uh, now, uh, uh, about a former army chief, you know, he was uh, serving then and it was about his assets. And in, an inquiry started. Uh, the uh, Amun Rani, uh, who is uh, uh, the founder of the website, Fact Focus, uh, he right uh, right now he lives in uh, United States. So he was uh, out of the reach of authorities and uh, they went after the guys who shared the information and there were uh, some tax officials who provided uh, details uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Ahmed Rani. And now they, uh, the case started in federal investigation authority and uh, uh, after uh, uh, a confession by uh, the FBR officials that they were helpful to some extent in sharing the information, they went after the guy because they were lacking a trail that how the information reached to Amon Rani because they had to uh, uh, prove it uh, in the court of law during the course of prosecution. And uh, uh, during their confessional statement of the leakers, they said that uh, they asked the question that, uh, who was the guy who connected you with Ahmed Rani? And they said, Shahid Islam. 
and Shahid Islam was a journalist. And from there, uh, the Federal Investigation Authority assumed. Uh, so it means that uh, Shahid Islam had uh, uh, also transmitted the information to Amman Rani, which was not the case. But anyway, he was uh, his house was raided and he was picked up. Not only he was picked up, his uh, gadgets were also picked up. And uh, he was in uh, FIA custody and uh, he was presented before the court and uh, uh, the journalists were also there, including me, and we were pleading his case other than uh, his lawyer. Uh, and, but our main concern was that they, they, want, uh, they were uh, seeking uh, the password of his laptop and his mobile phone, and which he was refusing to provide. The reason being that uh, obviously, you know, this is the most uh, precious asset of a journalist. And uh, at times, uh, uh, you know, even when I feel myself at some hostile uh, elements radar, my main concern is that even if uh, um, I'm under threat, my phone should not be under threat or my other gadgets should not be under threat. And I think uh, these are the feelings of every journalist. But in this case, they were snatched earlier. Uh, and uh, the uh, Federal Investigation Authority, it was not pleading that point. They were saying that uh, actually this guy was very instrumental in sharing the information and uh, transmitting it forward uh, to the, uh, you know, main, uh, you know, uh, criminal, I mean, in case of uh, journalists that uh, uh, he broke the story about uh, the army chief. Uh, so uh, this guy has to be investigated, by, but our focus remained on the password more than the journalist. Uh, but what later turned out, and that journalist was very, you know, uh, uh, he was quite determined. He said that they cannot seek my password. They will get it over my dead body. But what turned out later on, that the uh, federal investigation had, uh, authority had the capability to break the password. Uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, this might not have been possible had he had a MacBook or iPhone. Unfortunately, he didn't have either. And uh, they were able to break the password and uh, uh, the data was sent for the forensic, although it was not of their use. But this happened. Uh, and Poonam, as you, you suggested that ideally, we should have uh, separate gadgets for the personal and uh, the official use. Uh, uh, you know, even uh, I believe that, and uh, uh, I have attended different workshops, but we generally don't do it. So in such a case, uh, I think, uh, you know, we have to be more vigilant. Uh, even if we don't exercise this discretion or the uh, care that we, we are mentioning, when we are at someone's radar, then we have to be, you know, very uh, extra careful that uh, where to, you know, keep our uh, such gadgets safe. And uh, we should, uh, you know, we may have a burning uh, burner and, uh, uh, you know, a separate phone uh, if there is uh, something like that. So that remains a question. Uh, so in your case, uh, you know, they were uh, uh, asking for the gadgets through uh, court, but in, in the case under question, uh, in the case that I have mentioned, they already have the gadgets and they didn't have to seek the court's permission. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, when I look back, uh, I realize that uh, the journalist uh, who faced the trouble actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he might have avoided this, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is no, um, uh, final word, you know, there is uh, no insurance against uh, uh, such kind of uh, threats. And uh, I also strongly believe that when uh, the regime is hostile, or even if, uh, if there are non-state actors, hostile actors, um, we, uh, we cannot ward off all threats, but uh, we should be more professional, you know, to just minimize the threats. Uh, and uh, as uh, in the case of the legal, uh, you know, legal threats that Poonam had mentioned, I personally had suffered. Um, unfortunately, I lost a case, uh, not because uh, my story was incorrect, uh, but because 
uh, I could not document the proofs. I, uh, when uh, I reported uh, about uh, 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 that uh, particular issue, which uh, uh, brought me into trouble, uh, I uh, spoke to the concerned person. He suggested me to speak to four other persons. Uh, he said that they will uh, further enlighten me. And I didn't have any, you know, uh, uh, you know, any evil intention about him that uh, I just wanted to fix him by all means. That was not my uh, issue. So I spoke to all the four guys. Unfortunately, all the four of them, they, they also spoke against the guy who had suggested their names. And uh, there were some inquiries going on against him. Uh, when the case, uh, he came to me after the report was published and uh, he said that uh, he was in serious trouble. I said that I, I won't mind. Let me know how can I help. And he didn't have any idea that how can I help uh, in a professional way. And uh, he filed a case against me and uh, uh, it continued, I think, uh, for five, uh, five years. And I didn't take it much seriously by then. It started in 2010 and uh, it concluded in 2015. By the time he was uh, able to uh, get himself uh, out of different inquiries and the concerned department, they, they, uh, he even managed to you know, destroy the record. Uh, mm -hmm. I had the record earlier, but I could not keep it safe. When yeah. I spoke to him, I didn't realize that one day I have to show as an evidence that I took his version. And my story, it was almost 50%. It was his narrative because, uh, uh, you know, I asked him questions about the allegations leveled against him. And uh, his uh, version was fully incorporated. And when we went to the court, uh, uh, he said that, uh, you know, uh, he didn't speak to me. I said, I spoke to him. He said that bring an evidence that you spoke to me. So the lesson learned is that uh, you have to document such things. And there is a challenge that uh, sometimes people, they, they become cautious. Uh, generally, ethically speaking, we are taught that we, uh, we should tell the person we are speaking that you are recording him. And when you do that, they become extra careful. So that is a very tricky thing. Uh, at times, uh, you receive a call from a person and uh, uh, then you don't have a recorder. So in such a case, I think we should document in a way, for example, if there is any, uh, the critical part of information, you can uh, just uh, uh, text him again that uh, what you said about it, or uh, 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 this was, uh, what do you mean? Or this is what you said, so that at least you have an evidence that yeah. uh, you spoke to him. Uh, more documentation mean a lesser threat and uh, oh, just uh, you know uh, uh, you know um, as for the OCCRP concerned they are uh, uh, you know uh, I, I I don't think they uh, there is any uh, rigorous scrutiny uh, of the reporter as uh, I found there uh, well, you have to even uh, when you say that uh, 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 there was sunshine uh, the day I went to the guy they will say that, uh, do you have any evidence there was a sunshine? Uh, right. And you have <laughs> And, and so, then you'll have to produce uh, the meteorological uh, reports and all those things. That's that's great, uh, Omar. Thank you so much. We have all, I mean, almost run out of the time. And uh, you rightly said that the, our professional conduct is the only thing which can save us. So uh, that is uh, that is the important line which we uh, should uh, remember. Uh, we have some questions. Amal, over to you. Uh, thank you, Deepak. So we do have three questions, but I think they're all in the same vein. And I'm going to address it uh, mostly to our speakers, Poonam um, and Omar, but uh, Matt and uh, Runa, you can uh, feel free to jump in. So the question is basically, how, given the security threats that we've just spoken about, how does a tool like JSAT apply to journalists in countries like Pakistan and India, where there are a lot of a lot more threats? Um, I think, uh, Poonam, we can start with you and then go on to my. Well, uh, GSAT certainly helped you and keep you, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it, it so happens that we know it all, but we forget. So it's always good to document them and G JSAT will help you to understand that where you are lagging. So it's a tool which speaks about data storage, what using two devices, 
keeping personal phone and official phone separate. So these are the facts as right now we are talking to you know, and I have said myself, I, I keep two phones, but I mix them up sometimes in urgency. So this is just a gentle reminder that keep doing it in your day-to-day -day, uh, life. If you are especially an investigative journalist, you never know when you might need it. So JSAT is a platform which will help you where exactly you have not worked much on that in that particular area. And then maybe you can improve that uh, particular aspect of your work style. I think that will be a great reminder for me as well. I'll also get it done ASAP. Great. Thank you. Uh, Omar will go to you and then Matt will hear from you a bit about it. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's a kind of SOP. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's a kind of reminder, uh, standard operating procedure. Uh, we tend to forget again and again and uh, you know no matter how many trainings you have attended so uh, every time you know uh, you need a reminder that uh, how to you know keep yourself safe and uh, 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 this is uh, uh, very essential and uh, 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 it has a proper guideline that uh, 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 you know uh, by using it you can uh, just uh, 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 keep yourself safe yeah, I completely agree. You know, Poonam and Umar are absolutely right. We, we've designed it, hopefully, to be something that you can use to to check your own work, right? To just make sure that you're meeting best practices. As Poonam said, as much of a hassle as it is to juggle multiple devices and accounts and data, hopefully we're giving you a roadmap to help you do that a little bit easier, a little more easily. Uh, I think it's also a good tool to check, you know, maybe once a year. Uh, and just see and make sure that, you know, you haven't forgotten anything of the basics or maybe you need your threat level has changed and you need to adjust your practices that way. So hopefully it's a tool you can use frequently to just check against and make sure that you're, you're following recommended guidance. Um, thank you. That was all. That was all the questions we had time for, actually. Uh, so Deepak, over to you. Um, Deepak, I think you're on mute. So, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Amal. Unfortunately, we have completely run out of the time. But before we close, I would like to thank our GIGN team and our audience today, and most of all, a very big thank you to our guest speakers today, Matt, Runa, Poonam, and Umar. Finally, be sure to watch GIGN's Hindi and GIGN's Urdu Twitter feeds and also our website, gijn.org. And also, please don't forget to fill the feedback form. So once again, thank you all and goodbye.